following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So continuing our series on the, the preparation for esoteric studies and uh, psychological equilibrium. Um, in our previous two lectures, we talked about the mind and the heart. But the body uh, often gets neglected as um, important to spiritual work, uh, especially in the West. Um, in the East, they focus on it more. They have the, uh, the, the yogas and the, the asanas or, or postures that they work on. And, and a lot of emphasis is given to, the, um, to, to diet and uh, how to handle the physical body. Um, but in the West, uh, the way that religion has developed, we've uh, become very consumed with ideas about um, beliefs and with this notion that religion is based on ideas that we have in our head. Okay? I once knew someone who was very religious, um, in, in, in a Christian religion, um, who thought that the soul and the mind were the, the same thing. So that the concept you had in your head um, was equal to your soul. And this is an easy mistake to make if you think that the, these, these concepts are what what determine the fate of your soul, that these concepts are what save you. But um, in the Gnostic tradition, as opposed to a lot of the, uh, the Western philosophy, we're not interested so much in changing our beliefs. Uh, we believe in the respecting people's freedom of thought. And so, like Samuel of yours said, belong to whatever religion suits you. But what we do care about not so much the beliefs or concepts, but we care about where the rubber hits the road in facts, actions, and deeds. In other words, what's real. And so, some of Alain Dior said uh, in the Revolution of the Dialectic, Gnosis is lived upon facts and withers away in abstractions and is difficult to find even in the noblest of thoughts. So even good thoughts, even holy thoughts, are not what Gnosis is, not what this, this path is about. And it's, it's, it's useful to note in this quote that when we say Gnosis is lived upon facts, that word, hechos in Spanish, doesn't just mean facts. It also means deeds or actions. That's what Gnosis is. It's facts. It's what's real. It's deeds, actions. And so... St. Paul also said something, uh, something similar. He said, Some have become inflated with pride, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord is willing, and I will assert in not the talk of these inflated people, but their power. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So it's not a matter of theories or concepts or your intellect or belief. It's a matter of this, this real vitality, the power that underlies reality itself. And so, naturally, the physical body is very important for this. And we in this work are working on developing uh, self-knowledge and uh, a deeper cognizance of 
of ourselves and our reality. And this requires energy. The spiritual path that, that, we, uh, that we're walking on is based on three factors. Birth, death, and sacrifice that we talk about all the time. The death of our egos, the birth of virtues, compassion, and spiritual vehicles within us, and the sacrifice that we make for the good of humanity. And all three of these factors require energy. So we cannot abstract our spiritual work from the energy that we need in order to perform it. And our physical body is important because it, it is one of our primary transformers of energy. Now, in most of us, energy is being transformed in a mechanical way to serve the purposes of nature, like animals. All physical bodies in this world are, are transformers of energy of a, of a certain type or another. Um, because all matter is energy. So you take in, you take in the matter like, like food and, and air, and, you, it, and uh, also just raw energy like, like sunlight, you, you, and your body transforms that. Like, for instance, sunlight is needed to make vitamin D. So your body is, is continually transforming energy in a way that is, um, that is designed by nature in order to serve the purposes of nature. But we can also take conscious control of, of our bodies in order to modify this transformation of energy in order to serve the purposes of, of the spirit. And this is the, um, this is the, the upright pentagram with the, with the single point on the top representing the spirit dominating, dominating uh, matter, dominating uh, the four elements of nature. And so, sort of in this theme, from the, the day spring of youth, uh, Master M, he, uh, he talks a bit, of a, a bit about this, and he says, the physical body is the occultist's support and foundation and places him in a stronger position than the angels or demons. For he has the earth to spring from, and their feet have no resistance, for they dwell amid floating substances. Now, obviously, he's not talking about actually jumping off the earth. The feet is, is, is Makuth. Makuth is the, is the, the, the physical world. It, and it's in the center between heaven and hell, the, wor the world of the, the angels, the, the higher Sephiroth, and the world of the demons, the, or we call the Klippa, the world of the shells. And so having a physical body places us in a, in a unique position uh, to self-realize. It, it, animals and, and demons, those who are in, in the, the, the lower kingdoms, they're, they're, they're trapped within desires and instincts. And so their, their ability to... to work against these forces that are, that are acting within them, uh, compelling them to, to transform their energy in a certain way is, is, is very, very difficult at, that, at, at those levels. And it's very hard for them to put up resistance there, so they are propelled by these forces uh, and further downwards, so they cannot do any sort of, of spiritual work. And the, the angels and pratyekas in nirvana... And there's no resistance there either because they're not affected by the suffering that would, would help them develop more self-cognizance and inspire them to change. And so we, with our physical bodies, are, are in a, a, a very powerful position to advance in this work. Um, but how are we to, to, to prepare or utilize this body to, to, to serve this purpose? Dianne Fortune, in her book, Training and Work of the Initiate, uh, talks a bit about this, and she says, the occultist aims at making his physical body a vehicle that shall impede him as little as possible in his psychic activities. That is to say, it must be as refined as possible, using the word in the metallurgist sense, not in the social sense. Secondly, it must be of a strength and toughness to be able to endure the exceptional forces that he requires it to transmit. Now, we're going to talk, uh, talk about each of these things um, in detail. Now, refining in, in metallurgy means uh, purifying. It means, uh, so in, in, with relation to our body, um, it means removing any physical or psychic impurities. Sort of like when they refine metal, they try to remove any sort of impurities so you can get, get, get uh, 
pure silver or pure gold or, or whatever the metal is that you're trying to, you're, you're trying to uh, obtain. And in us, we have purities both of a, of a physical and, uh, and a, a spiritual or psychic type, and we're going to talk about both of these. Now, the physical impurities um, that we have are obvious. Um, now, but psychic impurities may seem a little strange to those who are, are new to these studies. Now, we say that Malkuth, or the, or the physical world, is feminine. But that, that doesn't mean that we are all women. Um, when we say that Malkuth is feminine, we, we mean that it receives influences from the other planes of existence. So energetic values in other spheres, that is to say other levels of reality beyond the physical world, uh, affect the transformation of energy in the physical body. So we need to be aware of how this works and how those forces are influencing us in our daily lives. She also talks about um, strength and toughness. Now, we don't want to read this in the wrong way. Now, if you are very strong, that's very good. But you don't need to be a bodybuilder or a, or a football player. Gandhi, for instance, uh, from India, the Mahatma, he was 90 pounds, but he endured a lot, and he used his body to change the course of a whole nation. So this is not, whether, this is not about whether you can, you can lift a tree trunk and carry it on your shoulders. Now, we tend not to focus too much on physical development because there seems to be a uh, a lot of focus it, uh, on it already in, in our culture. And it can easily become an obsession. Like you go to the gym and the, uh, you, you see the guy with the, with the, the 500 pound dumbbells and you're like, what's wrong with this guy? And you just make, he, he, he makes sure that everyone is looking at him before he, he, he lifts the bar, right? And so, uh, so uh, m m many in, in our culture become uh, uh, very obsessed with the, with the forms of, of the physical body and, and becoming uh, in increasingly, increasingly strong. And like Samuel and Vior, through his personality uh, of Thomas Akempis, sent him the imitation of Christ. He said, though physical exercise is very good, use it with caution and in moderation so that it does not become a hindrance to doing what is best. So exercise, but don't overdo it. Don't become obsessed with, with the idea of, of uh, building up the, the physical body. So we need to find a, we need to find a, a balance. And so if you're winded by walking up a flight of stairs, then maybe a little more exercise will, will, will do you good. Um, exercise is, is important for the, the health and well-being of the, of the physical body. Um, Especially here in the West, uh, like I said, um, in the West we sort of, uh, sort of have a, an skewed view of these things. There are, um, I, I, I once saw something that says there are, there are two types of people, uh, those, who have, uh, those who work and those who work out. And there's no intersection between the two. <laughs> and so I, either, either you're, uh, you, you, you go to the gym and you, 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 you work out a lot or you, you have a job and you sit at a desk for eight hours a day and you have this sort of sedentary lifestyle. And um, in America, this is especially becoming, uh, be becoming prevalent. They, uh, um, in, in this country, we have this, sort of this epidemic of, uh, of weight gain. Um, that uh, a lot of Americans have, have, have trouble with this. And uh, there are there are many causes there there are many causes of this and, and, and I, I don't want to uh, go too much into detail on that. There's been a, a, a lot of research and there's a lot of studies on that. Um, but one of the one of the, the causes of this is um, basically sitting down all the time. Now sitting in a chair, uh, sitting in a chair all day is is um, one for uh, for one is bad for your spine, and for two the um, They've, they've discovered that uh, if you sit for extended periods of time, then uh, it actually changes your, your metabolism so that the muscles in your, uh, in your body uh, uh, 
change how they, how they metabolize fats and sugars, and they stop producing certain proteins um, that, that regulate the storage of, uh, of fat in your body. So the, um, if you sit for, for, for longer than like 15 or 20 minutes, then your muscles go into a different state that causes them to start becoming uh, sedentary, and they change, uh, they, they change how they work. Um, so, like when, when, I'm, when I'm sitting at a desk um, or I'm working at a computer, a lot of times I'm, I'm standing up or uh, I'm, I'm getting up and walking around a lot. You don't have to, you don't have to be comp uh, active all the time, but um, even just moving your muscles a little bit uh, every uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so can stop them from moving into this, uh, this, this sleepy state. Um, a lot of people have this idea that they, 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 they go to the gym and they, they, they burn a lot of calories. But when you actually, um, I had to do this in physics class once when I was, when I was in college. Um, when you actually calculate like the number of calories that is required to like, like lift, a, lift a barbell or something, um, it's actually not that much. A calorie is, is a large amount of energy. And so the, the, the walking and the, um, and the lifting that we do for like the, the, the one hour or so that we may be at the gym really isn't, uh, isn't the primary burner of calories that we have in our life. Um, you, 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 you burn more calories in the, in the, the, the 15 minutes of just, uh, the 15 hours that you have of, of, of going, going about your daily life than you will in the, in the one hour you have at, at, at the gym. Um, so you may be burning calories at a faster rate at the gym, but it's, it's, it's not really uh, enough to boost you significantly over the, the resting metabolism of your body, which is relatively high if you're never sedentary. And so there's, we have this sort of uh, misconception about um, what is actually making us thin. Um, did I put this quote in here? No. Okay. Master Moria also had the, uh, a quote about sitting in a chair that I, um, I wanted to mention. He says, the student should not rely upon the back of the chair to support his spine, nor should he lounge or nor sit cross-legged as, as, uh, in his practices as in the East, for the Western body is not adapted to this posture. And so uh, with regards to posture, it, it helps to, um, like, when, I, when I sit in the chair, I like to uh, support myself with my, with my lower back. Um, rather than, than, than slouching in the chair, because that can lead to a uh, like curvature of the spine if you, if you, uh, if you slouch. Um, however, for, for this lecture, it's okay if you slouch, right? Because, <laughs> because it, uh, I, I know everyone's trying to sleep in the lecture, and so if you, if you, it's hard to sleep if you're, if you're sitting upright. So, so for here, you, you, can, you, can, you can rest. But like when you go out in your daily lives, you want, you want to sit up straight. Um, and it's, also, it's also valuable to... Uh, 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 to notice um, his, uh, his comments on the posture, and we, we, we mentioned that a lot in this school, in that uh, in America, a lot of the, uh, the meditation tradition has come over from the East, the, uh, the, the Hindus and the Buddhists who come over and, and bring along with their meditation tradition this, 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 uh, this practice of development of the mind, um, the, the postures that are associated with that tradition in their culture. And so a lot of Buddhists you talk to, um, and they say you, you cannot meditate unless you can sit in, in a particular posture on a, on a, on a cushion um, with your legs twisted up like a pretzel. And then the, uh, they, start, they try to teach this to the Westerners, and the Westerners are just suffering, suffering. I, I spent hundreds of hours uh, sitting, on, uh, sitting on those, those uh, because meditation cushions, because um, I, I, I learned uh, meditation from uh, uh, in Zen Buddhism. And um, there is some value to those postures, and uh, if you sit with them long enough, eventually, um, eventually you're just going to endure the pain. Um, <laughs> which, is <laughs> which, which is a good skill to have, knowing how to uh, endure physical pain, but that's not really the purpose of, of, of meditation. <laughs> Um, it's, it's so in the West, where we haven't really, uh, where, where we haven't uh, re really developed our bodies from an early age to uh, to sit in these postures, it helps to um, to to sit in a, either in a chair, 
um, with, your, with your spine straight or, or, or lying down. It's also a, a very good posture. And um, Mas Master uh, Moria in, in this book, he, um, he, mentions, he mentions those two postures as, as, as being uh, useful. Now, with regards to uh, utilizing the physical body and, and preserving the energy of the body, uh, Swami Sivananda uh, has this to say. He says, semen nourishes the physical body, the heart, and the intellect. Only that, only that man who uses the physical body, heart, and intellect can have perfect brahmacharya. Uh, brahmacharya means a sexual abstention. A palawan, or a wrestler, who uses his physical body, but on, uh, who uses his physical body only, but keeps, but keeps the intellect and heart undeveloped, cannot expect to have full brahmacharya. He can have brahmacharya of the body only, but not of the mind and the heart. The semen that belongs to the heart and mind will certainly flow out. If, if an aspirant does only japa, which is mantra, mantra practice and meditation, um, if he does not develop the heart, and if he does not practice physical exercises, he will only have mental brahmacharya. The portion of the semen which goes to nourish the heart and the body will flow out. But an advanced yogi who dives deep in meditation will have full brahmacharya even if he does not take the physical exercise. Now, obviously he does, he's not referring to, to physical semen here. Um, uh, but rather it's, it's the, the vital energy or the, the ensemenis, the essence of the semen that is present in both men and women. Uh, not just in the sexual organs, but in all centers of the body. And in Gnosis, we seek to use this, this vital energy in order to perform uh, spiritual work. And it's sort of the, the, the overarching theme of these, uh, these preparing the blank lectures is uh, how to uh, preserve and correctly transform this vital energy in all the centers of the body. Um, for those who are at, at a beginning or a preparatory level of the path. <clears throat> and um, as he points out, physical exercise is important. And it's worth noting that Swami Sivananda was one of the primary carriers of, of yoga um, to the, the Western world. However, uh, we tend not to place too much emphasis on physical exercise because as we develop in the practice, some of the purposes served by the physical exercise are just as well served by other practices. Um, However, most of us are not at the level described by Swami Sivananda to allow us to skip exercise altogether. So um, maybe someday, but for, but for now, um, uh, still go for your daily walk. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that we do have physical ex exercises in this tradition. We have uh, uh, runic postures and, and the sacred rites for, for rejuvenation, for instance. And uh, these are helpful to developing the physical body but are connected to spiritual practices so that uh, it, it avoids helping us become identified with, um, with, with just the, the, the physical sens sensations or, 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 or physical desires, the beauty, uh, nahimat. Um, and it, it keeps us, it allows us to put our physical body in a context of always using it as a vehicle to serve the spirit. Now, since we, since we went on this tangent about um, exercise, we're going to go back a little bit and um, uh, return to the importance of removing impurities uh, from the body. Now, Dan Fortune says the, the ductless, or that is the endocrine glands, uh, pour their secretions into the bloodstream, and the blood is literally the essence of man. After, alter the chemical composition of the blood, and you alter consciousness as witnessed the phenomena of both anesthesia and insanity, many types of the latter clearing up completely when septic foci, such as tonsils or teeth, are eradicated, and other types responding to the addition of products of certain, uh, certain of the ductless glands to the bloodstream, in which previously the due proportion was lacking. The occultist, therefore, for the delicate processes of specialized consciousness in which he indulges, must have an absolutely pure bloodstream that will not in any way distort or falsify the consciousness. It is the, the neglect of this elementary precaution which is at the root of much psychic trouble. And one of the most frequent and common causes of so-called of so obsession is contemplation. 
The bloodstream, loaded with impurities, reabsorbed from the intestines, affects consciousness, and consciousness, thus debased, contacts its corresponding astral aspect, and the psychic faculties do the rest, revealing to the sufferer uh, the nature of that which he has been brought into touch. Now, Samuel and VR wrote a whole book about this called Endocrinology and Criminology, where he talks about the, the, the endocrine system and, and how it acts in our body. Um, many of us are not aware of how the contents of our, of our blood um, are affecting how we perceive life. Uh, but if we think about it, the, uh, it becomes obvious uh, how, how, these, how some of these forces work. Um, one way that is very common among, uh, among certain, uh, certain schools of, uh, in the Gnostic tradition is the, uh, the use of plants to have uh, experiences. Um, and there are many traditions do this um, uh, in, in areas that, that have plants that, that are useful for this. Um, and, and, and many Gnostics, because uh, uh, Gnosis uh, developed in the, uh, in, in the Latin America area and also in, in, in South America, um, they, they, they're also involved in, in practices with the use of plants for e experiences. Um, in this particular Gnostic school, we tend to uh, discourage such practices um, and prefer to be, to, to, to be more in alignment with, with uh, how, how Dion Fortune is advising and to have a, a pure bloodstream and work, in, and work on developing our consciousness through, through, through practice rather than through, through cactus. Um, there's this, there's this story making around among uh, uh, some, uh, some Gnostics uh, about this, this kid from, from England um, who went down to Colombia and um, tried yahe or, or, or ayahuasca. And um, he, uh, he, he took this, this, this plant, which is meant to uh, uh, foster a, a spiritual trip. And um, he, was, he was working under the guidance of a, of a, of a shaman there. But uh, he had some adverse effects to this, and the um, the, the shaman uh, the, the shaman basically took him and said, "Oh, don't worry, I'll take care of him." And then they they later found the the kid dead in a ditch on the side of the road. It was very sad. Um, but it 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 shows how how, how dangerous these these substances can be. Because um, uh, this 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 kid, he was only like like in his twenties. He he died. Trying to trying to, to, to use this plant, um, and so that's that's a, that's a big risk, and so that's um, one of the reasons among uh, among others that we um, we discourage the use of of these uh, these hallucinogenic types of plants to uh, to have experiences. Like I said, some Gnostic schools do that, and um, they are they are free to do as they wish. But in, in this particular Gnostic school, we um, we tend to go the other way. Uh, also, um, a way that uh, that science has just recently discovered, in which uh, a lot of humanity is um, is altering their consciousness, um, is uh, through birth control pills. Um, and, and some of you have, uh, may have may have heard me uh, uh, tell this story, but this is the they just recently discovered this in the past uh, past few years. Um, there's this thing called an MHC, which stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. But it's, um, it's a sequence of genes uh, related to uh, your immune system. And um, what happens is that, that your body has a certain immune system that is, is uh, very good at repelling certain types of disease, but may have uh, weaknesses in, in other areas. And um, <coughs> this, uh, your body signals what kind of immune system it has through, through uh, the odor that, that it emits, your, your body odor and, the, and your saliva. And so um, when, when we look for, for sexual partners, our body is naturally drawn towards people who have an immune system that is, that is different from ours because uh, the physical body in, in the, the instinctual center is looking to, um, to create children that uh, have... Uh, uh, an immune system that is very uh, robust and, and can repel a lot of diverse diseases. Um, and so to do that, it, goes, it, it, it seeks to mate with, with those with a different immune system because it says, like, I have weaknesses in my immune system, but if I mate with this person whose immune system is very different, that I can, my children will have those, those, those gaps filled up, right? So that the children, the children uh, through successive generations of mating like this, will gradually develop stronger and stronger uh, immune systems to protect the species. Now, 
um, in women, um, this this uh, it, it, this this works both in both in men and in and in women. And so, like part of the reason why we're drawn to kiss is um, so that we can taste the saliva of the other person. You probably don't even know this, but your body is subconsciously tasting the saliva of the other person to test their um, their 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 MHC compatibility with your immune system to see if they're to see if if their uh, if their immune system is is uh, sufficiently compatible with yours to make r r robust children, and also the the the, uh, the smell of the other person uh, will, will cause us to be um, to be attracted to them if they uh, if they're compatible with us in this way, um, and uh, if if they're not compatible, we we, we will tend to be uh, repelled by them uh, uh, subconsciously because like. We don't even know that our body is doing this, but in our instinctual center, our body is looking to uh, to, to 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 mate with people who, who have this type of uh, immune system. Now, what happens when? Because um, I said this is about altering the consciousness, right? So what happens is that um, when the, uh, the the this modern invention called birth control pills that uh, a, a woman can take that um, alter the uh, that that alter the hormonal composition of her body. Uh, that stop her from getting pregnant, and the reason, the, the way it does that is by basically tricking her body, uh, g giving her a, 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 a hormonal state that so that it believes that it's already pregnant, because the body, if it thinks it's already pregnant, it's not going to try to get pregnant again. And so the uh, the woman uh, she takes this the, she takes this the, these pills, and her body thinks that it's pregnant. And when the woman's body thinks that it's pregnant. It changes the types of immune systems that it is attracted to. And here's the reason. Because um, a woman who is pregnant is in a, uh, is in a vulnerable state. And so uh, through this, this process of, uh, of, of development of the species, because uh, we, uh, we are intellectual animals, we're, we're, we're part of the animal kingdom, um, someone in a, in a vulnerable state uh, wants to be near uh, those who will protect them, and uh, those who are most likely to protect you are like your 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 father or your brothers, or your cousins, those who are related to you. Um, and so, those who are related to you are likely to have an immune system that is very similar to yours, not very different. And so, the types of person that a, a, a woman is drawn to when her body thinks it is pregnant is completely different from the, the type of person she is drawn to when her body is trying to get pregnant. Make sense? And so by taking the, by taking the pills, she is altering who she is attracted to sexually. And uh, this is uh, one, one, one of, the, uh, one of the, the reasons they think that divorce has become so prevalent in, in modern society, because the, this... Uh, the, the birth control pill has, becoming, uh, has become more prevalent. That people are taking this pill uh, when, they're, when they're in the dating stage, before they get married, um, and before they want to have kids, and then they, um, then they go and they, they find a partner based on this perception of what they find attractive. And then they get married, right? And then they say, okay, now I want to start a family, I want to have kids. So they stop taking the pill. And when they stop taking the pill, it changes who they find attractive, and all of a sudden, this person they were attracted to before, they're not attracted to anymore because they, they change the chemical composition of their body. And then they, they, become, they become repelled by their partner rather than being attracted to them. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very sad because they, uh, they, they, they get into these, these, these relationships that their, their body instinctually uh, uh, would not have wanted. And the, um, they said it's, it, this could also lead to, to more difficulty having children, too, once they actually get married, because now the children um, are being conceived with, without this, uh, this more robust immune system that they, that uh, that they would have had um, if they had, had mated with someone with, a, uh, uh, with greater uh, immunodiversity. Um, and now the, uh, the children in the womb have, have a weaker immune system, and the, uh, uh, it's harder for them to survive. And so that's, uh, that's, that's one way that's very common in our society in which the chemical composition of our blood, the things that we, we take through, through medicine, are, are changing the way that we perceive reality, even on this very, this very base instinctual level that we might not have even known. And they just discovered this within the past like five or six years or so. Now, so 
we want to be conscious of, of what is going on in our body of what is, and, and what is going into it. Um, so we don't want to eat trash. Um, so be, we, we, we be careful of, 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 of pesticides and, and junk food and, and fast food. Like, like I, um, I don't want to uh, uh, riff on, on McDonald's because some people are, uh, like, see standing up. Uh, some people, <laughs> some people are, uh, really, really, like that, really like that establishment. Um, but uh, I, find it, I, I find it difficult to, to eat there. I, 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 was, uh, I was forced into McDonald's once by um, some, some friends that I was with, and I'm like, I really don't want to be in this place. But uh, since, I was, since I was there, I was there anyways. It was like, maybe I can, I can order like a fruit salad or something. Because it was like, it's fruit. What can they do to fruit, right? So I got this, this, I got this fruit salad from, 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 from McDonald's. And it was just, it was just fruit. It was like grapes and apples or something like that. Although, uh, when you have like, like a cut up apple, uh, an apple is supposed to, when it's cut up, it's supposed to be brown. Right? I had this, um, this biology teacher in, in high school who, who showed us two apples. It was two halves of an apple, right? And one was all brown and disgusting looking. And the other was, 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 was white and pristine and perfect. And he said, which one of these two apples would you rather eat? We also we want to eat the we want to eat the good looking apple. We said I want to eat the brown one because the uh, this pristine apple has been dunked in hydrochloric acid. That's the only way the only way to make an apple <laughs> like uh, stay like that for a long period of time. Um, your apple's supposed to be brown if it's it's been cut open. Um, but these apples at McDonald's were very pristine looking, and <laughs> and I, I I went and I, I took a bite of this this fruit. I thought I was eating fruit, right? But the pestis, uh, the uh, the preservatives on this fruit were so thick that I could actually taste them. I couldn't even taste the fruit through all the preservatives. And I'm like, I can't eat this. So I took the rest of my fruit salad, I threw it away. Uh, so I, was, um, I wasn't very happy with my experience there. Maybe some other people will, will, had, had, uh, had a better time. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it just, just uh, be, be careful about what you uh, uh, throw, in, throw into your body. Um, Diet, so your diet is, imp is important. Um, I'm not going to discuss diet a lot in this lecture um, because we already have a lot, I mean, a lot of lectures talking about what to eat. Um, we have uh, a whole course on, on, the, on the website that you can download called uh, Healthy Spirituality or Caring for Your Temple that talks about all different uh, aspects of, of, of how to nourish ourselves. There is also a, uh, a lecture called Proper Nourishment on the Path of Self-Realization that... Um, that addresses this topic. So I'm just going to summarize diet in the way that, that, that Dion Fortin does. And she says, from the point of view of practical occultism, the first requisite is a sane mind and a sound body. And whatever diet produces that result is a satisfactory diet. <laughs> so uh, do whatever you need to, to nourish your body. All of us have different types of bodies and have different uh, nutritional needs. So um, be cognizant of, of, the, of the elements that you're putting into your body and be cognizant of the, of the, the types of things that you need in order, to, um, uh, in order to properly nourish yourself. And uh, don't eat things that will make you constipated. Um, I wasn't gonna talk, I wasn't gonna talk about constipation, right? But I was, I was studying all these things about the preparing of the body and uh, so many, so many of these, these uh, uh, esoteric authors, they talked about the, the dangers of constipation. So uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, bring up another one because Dion Fortune talked about constipation. Master Moria also talked about constipation, the day spring of youth. So I'm going I'm to give it another mention. Uh, he says, civilization's great gift to humanity is constipation. We have become unnatural in our habits, causing pressure at the base of the rectum, and many children are born with the lower intestine not held in its proper alignment. The moment the physical body disposes of its waste, a signal is sent to the different centers of the body to do likewise, and each nerve center also responds. This occurs in the mental atmosphere as well. Remember that regular habits of this kind clarify the mind. At, when he says regular habits, you know, it means be regular. And, and one should always keep this tract open and, and clean. Now, um, Samuel uh, Vior, he has some cures for constipation. He has one that involves like uh, uh, obscure things that are not sure even grow, even grow in America. And another one involves um, prunes and, and waters and, and water, um, that, which is easy to find here. Um, so uh, eat your prunes and, and, and uh, drink a lot of water. And if you want the precise, uh, the precise uh, cure, it's in uh, the, uh, the, the esoteric medicine book. Um, and speaking of water, I put this in here because uh, I, I, just, I just love water so much. Um, uh, Master Moria says, before beginning your breathing exercises, take a drink of water. 
Um, for we should remember that the body will take as much water as we will give it. It is often thirsting for it, as otherwise it cannot clear itself of its impurities. We should drink fresh water between meals and keep a pitcher where we can see it. My water is empty. Boo. Um, I just want to drink my thing here. I love water. Now, these, um, in addition to uh, the, the uh, uh, talking about diet, one of the healthy spirituality lectures that I mentioned earlier also talks about water. And water is actually very, very important to the body. Most, most people in our society just don't drink enough water. Um, dehydration causes, um, in addition to constipation, um, headaches and, and drowsiness. And many times when we, we think we are tired, right, really we are just dehydrated. And so um, drinking, drinking water helps us to, uh, uh, helps us to cure that. Like, like what I do is uh, in, in, my, in my room next to my desk, I have the, uh, 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 a jug of water, a one-quart jug of water, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking swigs from it every, every few minutes during the day. Um, and I was, uh, I was doing that a lot last night, too, because right, uh, uh, last night when it was 5 a.m. Um, uh, and I was working on this lecture, I thought I was tired, but uh, uh, it turns out I was just thirsty. Really, really thirsty. <laughs> and uh, so uh, if you're feeling tired, drink some water. And... Uh, and drinking water also helps to cleanse the body of, of impurities, uh, providing there aren't more toxins in the water than, than, it, than, than uh, it's actually taking out. Um, so be, be careful about that. I, I, like to, um, uh, I like to put my water through a, a, a filter, because um, uh, I, I have tap water, right? But then I filter it with, uh, uh, to take out impurities and, uh, and the fluoride, because I, uh, I don't like the, the, the fluoride in my, in my water too much. Um, now... As I mentioned at the beginning, more than just physical substances uh, can affect the health of the body. Now, we learned a lot about this two weeks ago when we listened to a lecture called uh, Health, Healing, and Awakening, which is a very good lecture also about this topic um, that I, I, I recommend. Um, and his, in his esoteric medicine book, uh, Samuel and Vior tell, talks about some of these, these other influences that can affect the body. And... He mentions uh, five causes of illness that I believe he got um, uh, from, uh, from Paracelsus. And these five causes of illness are called ens astrale, ens veneri, ens spirituale, ens nature, and ens dei. Now, there is a long, long lecture about each of these on the site called the, called the five causes of illness. And uh, I encourage you to listen to that because that's a very good lecture. But... Um, if you're just joining us now, uh, I'll summarize these here so you get the idea of the kinds of forces that are influencing the body and, and how to deal with them. Now, the first is called uh, ens astrale, or the essence of the, the, the astral. And Samuel and Vior in, in esoteric medicine describes it this way. It says, the astral light is the basis for all sicknesses and the fountain of all life. Every sickness, every epidemic has its astral larvae. When these larvae become coagulated in the human organism, a sickness is the outcome. <clears throat> when the astral body is already healed, then mathematically, the physical body will be healed. Because before the physical atoms of an organ can become sick, the internal atoms of the same organ are already sick. When the cause is cured, the effect is also cured. We must have our homes clean in the physical world as well as in the astral. Garbage deposits are always filled with infected larvae. There exist odoriferous su substances which burn the larvae or which throw them out of a house, like, like burning sulfur, for instance, is, is useful for this. Um, we must avoid having relationships with evil people since these people are centers of astral inf infection. So what he's explaining here is just how the... the <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she, she scooted away. <laughs> is how the, the astral influences uh, uh, affect the body. Um, and so we need to have a clean environment and, as well as to be clean, uh, be clean ourselves. Did I put this quote in here? Did I take the... Oh, yeah. Okay. So some of you talks a little bit about cleanliness here. Um, he says, The Gnostic must be a clean, tidy, decent, honest, 
and upright person. He should always be punctual and happy, never angry with anyone, nor should he be against anyone in any way. The devotee should shower or wash himself daily, and he should dress presentably. The Nasu can never washes himself or is, or is in great disorder, causes damage to humanity in such a way that, that with his bad taste he may drive people away from the Gnostic studies. For, in, for example, people might say, if this is what Gnostics are like, I do not want to enter into these studies. I don't want to degenerate myself. And in, um, as an aside, in, in, in some cultures, uh, uh, Gnosis is viewed as, as, as a cult. Um, and uh, some say you can see why, because as, as sometimes people come into these Gnostic studies and they become uh, uh, fanatical uh, about certain things, and that um, uh, people with, with a sane mind see this, see, this, see this fanaticism and they say, oh, that's not very healthy. And so we, um, we, don't, want to, uh, we don't want to be fanatics. Like he says, uh, the Gnostic must not be a fanatic. We must study everything in order to reject the useless and accept the useful. Gnosis is not against any religion, school, order, or sect. We have fought for the moral purification of many religions, schools, orders, and sects. We have never been against any religion, school, or sect. We know that humanity is divided into groups, and that each group needs its own system of particular instruction. All religions, schools, orders, and sects are precious pearls that are strung on the golden thread of divinity. So, we need cleanliness both in our environment and in our bodies. We also need to clean our minds. We need to, 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 to free ourselves of, um, of, of the fanaticism and, and, uh, and, and being opposed to, to, to other people's uh, spiritual work um, so that we do not become the evil people that Samuel and Lior is telling us to avoid. Um, and, and so, like, like with ourselves, the, these, uh, the, the mental habits that we have also make, make us, ourselves, a source of, of, of astral infection. Um, and uh, he talks about this in the next, in the next section here, ends, uh, ends veneery. Yeah. Yep. Come on. Ends veneery. Okay. The second cause of illness. When the semen falls outside of the womb, then because of its corrupted salts, certain parasites are formed. These parasites adhere to the astral body of the one who created them. Thus, in this way, they absorb the life of their creators. When abandoning the physical body because of its death, the soul takes all of its conscious values. When reincarnating into a new physical body, the soul then brings all of its conscious values. They could be evil as well as good. These values are positive and negative energies. Every common and current human being has a culture of larvae in his, actual, in his astral atmosphere. These have such strange forms that they are too odd to conceive of mentally. Positive values bring health and joy, and negative values materialize themselves into sickness and bitterness. Now, ends veneery. Uh, veneery uh, is a Latin word, and it comes from the same root as, as Venus. So ens venere refers to the types of illnesses that, that are engendered out of, of, of sexual love. Um, in essence, ens venere, uh, uh, ens venere refers to uh, illnesses caused by uh, adultery, like a karmic connection to uh, another person, or, 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 fornic or fornication, which is the, the, the orgasm in, in any way that, that, that we might have it. That's, that's ens venere. And it causes the, uh, the, the creation of these um, these. these Psychic connections and astral, and astral larvae that, that, that cause us suffering um, in our, our physical body, uh, as, well as, as well as our internal bodies. The next one is uh, ens spirituale. He, he, he describes the black magicians utilize the elementals of plants and the tattvas in order to harm their neighbors from a distance. The ethereal body is the vital body of the human being. It's constituted of the tatvas, and we know that this body is the base upon which the organism's chemistry operates. If the ethereal body is harmed, then mathematically the physical body is also harmed. So, by utilizing the vegetal elementals and their ethereal waves from a distance, the perverse entities can cause harm to the ethereal body. And the consequences are very grave. The black magicians know how to inject venomous substances into the astral body of their victims, Thus, inevitably, they become sick. Now, 
this isn't a lecture on the Tatfus. We have lectures on Tatfus too. But um, just as sort of a, a foundation so you can understand this, um, the tatva that he's referring to here is just, uh, it's a vibration of ether, um, which uh, the ether is, is the, the, the fundamental matter of, of reality. It's, 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 a, it's a modification of, of, of prana, the, the, the root energy of existence. Um, and tatva is a Sanskrit word just meaning truth or fundamental principle. Um, Samuel, Samuel Yongamriyor describes the tatva this way. He said, the whole universe is elaborated upon with the ethereal matter. Can you put this in? No, okay. He says, the whole universe is elaborated upon with the ethereal matter, akash. This word is used by the Hindus. The ether disarranges itself into seven different modalities, or tattvas. When these modalities condense, then they give origin to all that is created. So a, a modality, or just, just a, a mode of operation, um, is just uh, a particular vibration of the ether. And uh, we, we talk about, um, there are seven tattvas, but we usually refer to the, the, the five ones that are, that are uh, part of our, our common experience, which is the akasha, which is the ether, apas, water, vayu, air, tehas, fire, and prithvi, earth. Now, when I associate these tattvas with the elements, I do not mean to say that vayu is the air, or that tehas is the fire, etc. Like I said, the tafa is just a, a vibration of the ether. They are not the elements, but they give origin to the elements when they condense. Because all matter um, is just a, a, a condensation of, of energy. This is uh, uh, demonstrated by science. And so when we see the actual element, um, like the earth, that is the, the, the earth is a, is a condensation of certain types of energy. And so we use the, 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 this word tafa to, um, to refer to the particular uh, vibration of energy that, uh, that uh, is the, the, found, uh, the foundational principle, because remember, tattva means uh, uh, a foundational principle. So the tattva prithvi is the foundational principle of the earth, but it's not the earth. Got it? Okay. So you can think of them as the, the root nature of each of these elements. And the other two tattvas that we're not going to mention are adi and uh, samadhi, which are very, very elevated. So basically... Ends of spirituality uh, refers to the, the, the work of, of, of black magicians or, or influence of these, uh, negative influences of these, of these tattvas on the, uh, the, our astral or vital bodies. The next one is ends nature. Now, Samael says, when the, the ethereal body of the human being is weakened, then, by the action of reflection, the physical organism becomes sick. The ethereal body has its physical center in the spleen. The solar energies, which are the vital principle of everything, everything that exists, penetrate through the spleen into our physical organism. The ethereal body is an exact duplicate of the physical body and is made up of tattvas. Each ethereal atom penetrates into each physical atom and an intense vibration is produced. All of the chemical processes of the organism are, are developed based on the ethereal body or second organism. Every organ of the physical body uh, becomes sick when its ethereal counterpart has become sick. When the ethereal body is healed, the physical body is healed as well. Now, so, ins nature ref refers to problems with the vital body or the ethereal body. In particular, the four ethers of the ethereal body related to the it, it related to the chemical processes of, of the body and, and the memory. And some of the describes these ethers a bit in, uh, in the esoteric medicine book. He's, um, he mentions the, the chemical ether, the, the ether of life, uh, the luminous ether, and, and the reflective ether. Um, he says the chemical ether and the ether of life serve as a source of man, uh, for the manifestation of the forces that work in the, the biochemical and physiological processes and all that is related to the reproduction of the races. So those, um, the, the, these, because the, the ethereal body, if we say it's the ethereal body, it's, it's because it's made up of these, these ethers, right? And um, the, we, we categorize these ethers, and two of the ethers um, are used to, to work the, the, the chemical processes of, of the physical body, like, like, uh, like uh, the sexual generation and like the digestion and the very processes of the body, right? And, um, he says, 
light, heat, color, and sound identify themselves with the luminous and reflective ethers, the other two ethers of the ethereal body. He said the sapient soul expresses herself within these two ethers. She is the beloved maiden of our memories. When seen clairvoyantly, this maiden looks like a beautiful lady within the ethereal body. And so our processes of, of, of memory, both in the physical world and in the astral world, are related to these other two ethers of the, of the ethereal body, the luminous and, and the reflective ethers. So all of this is related to our vital body. Um, and when the, body becomes, uh, the vital body becomes sick, we refer to that as ens naturae. And finally, we have ens dei, which means the essence of, dei means God, the essence of God. Um, Samuel says, when the, hu uh, when the human soul unites with its innermost, then it does not have karma to bay. Because when an inferior law is transcended by a superior law, the superior law washes away the inferior law. The worst genres of sickness are those which are engendered by karma. So ends day is basically karma. Uh, St. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, um, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. And so this is referring to um, uh, ways in which we, we, we defile or destroy the, the, the temple of God in ourselves. And um, he talks later in, in, in Corinthians, uh, uh, flee fornication, because whoever, sins, uh, whoever fornicates sins against his own body. Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, and in relation to this is the, uh, a particular type of karma that, that, that we refer to as uh, uh, kamadura, um, which is the, uh, the karma of, of fornication. And the, uh, 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 refers to uh, a type of karma that must be paid with, with pain, um, which is very severe. Um, so if, if, you, uh, if you're dealing with karma with ends day um, is, uh, is the, 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 the most severe kind of sickness to have. But uh, remember, we have the, um, some encouragement from, from Krishna in, in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita who, uh, who helps us, who, who, who gives us some advice on how to deal with this if we do find ourselves in that situation. He says, uh, even if you were the most sinful of sinners, Arjuna, you could cross beyond all sin by the raft of spiritual wisdom. Gnosis. As the heat of a fire reduces wood to ashes, the fire of knowledge burns to ashes all karma. Nothing in this world purifies like spiritual wisdom. It is the perfection achieved in time through the path of yoga, the path which leads to the self within. And so... One of the ways we try to, uh, we, we, we try to cure ourselves of, or, or prevent the occurrence of, of sicknesses by, by ends day um, is, to, is to be cognizant of the ways in which we engender uh, negative karmas within ourselves. And um, to try to act in better harmony with, uh, with the, the flow of energy in, um, in nature so that we don't create uh, karmic disturbances that will uh, reflect back on us with, uh, with suffering. Um, <clears throat> and as Samuel Lenvior describes uh, in the medicine book, there is no danger of harmful discordance if the body, soul, and mind are in perfect harmony. Yet, if a cause of discordance originates in any of these three planes, then the disharmony is communicated to the other planes. When the human being obeys the law, the glorion, he cannot become sick. Therefore, sickness comes because of disobedience to the law. When the seven bodies want to act separately as if they were seven eyes, sickness is then the outcome. When all the acts of our daily life, even the most significant acts, become the living expression of the glorion in ourselves, we will then 
never be sick. And so just like the, uh, the, the other lecturer was talking about in, the, um, in the, the, the previous lecture two weeks ago about health, um, really the, the foundation of health is, is causing ourselves to vibrate in alignment with, um, with the, the glorion, the, the being of our being, the spirit within us. And if we do that, um, we can never become sick. But we have this thing the, the, called the ego that, that, we, that we carry around with us that, that uh, creates complications for our, uh, our attempts to vibrate in harmony with, with the glory on, with the being of our being. And um, so part of, uh, part of how we can, we can foster this, uh, this development of the health of the physical body is to work on the ego. And one of the things that the ego, um, the ego does to us is it causes um, uh, tension or stress. And so uh, we have to uh, learn how to relax. Samuel Lombrior said in the Revolution of the Dialectic, one has to remember oneself. One has to relax the body as many times as one can during the day. And so Samuel Lombrior talked a lot of he said this continually, to always be relaxing the body. And why is this important? He says in, in a lecture, uh, knowing how to listen. So dear readers, we have to reflect more and more upon these psychological matters. Great truths are understood when one does not forget his real being, when one profoundly remembers the self the Atman. Therefore, we recommend that you, our reader, remember yourself on a daily basis and relax your physical body completely on a sofa, just for a moment, whether it be for five or ten minutes or for half an hour. Then, one day, you will be able to experience the reality within your consciousness. This practice brings the superior emotional center together with the motor center into activity. Thus, when in complete relaxation, our consciousness experiences the being, feeling him, experiencing him. So, it is fundamental to become receptive to our being. Our personality has to become more and more passive and receptive to the word that comes from the heights. The word comes through the superior centers of the being. This is how the word arrives. However, if we are not receptive, if we do not know how to relax our bodies, if we forget ourselves, how could we receive the messages that come forth through the superior centers of our being? <clears throat> our readers have to comprehend that we have to become receptive, that it is necessary to learn to receive the word and to capture its profound meaning. We have to relax and remember ourselves, our own being, daily. In this way, we will successfully advance. And so when the, uh, when the body is in tension, there's a, there's a, a, a discord created between the, uh, the, the physical body and the, uh, and, the, and the internal body. It's like the astral body and the mental body. And so we're, um, we're exerting energy in the physical body. And so we're not correctly receiving the, energy, uh, uh, the, the impulses from the, the internal planes. So how should we relax? Some of you gives a, a practice in um, introduction to gnosis that uh, some people might find helpful. Um, he says... Without mental force, it is impossible to achieve the crystallization of a project, a commercial, etc. It is necessary for our students to learn how to use mental force, but it is necessary for the student to first learn how to relax his physical body. It is indispensable to know how to relax the body in order to achieve the perfect concentration of the mind. We can relax the body seated in a comfortable chair 
or lying down in the corpse posture with our heels touching each other, arms close to our sides, etc. The second of the two positions, the corpse posture, is the better. Now he gives a practice. Imagine that your feet are subtle, that a group of dwarves escapes from them. Imagine that your calves are, are full of small, playful dwarves that leave one by one, and that as they leave, the muscles become flexible and elastic. Continue with your knees, performing the same exercise, continuing with the thighs, sexual organs, abdomen, heart, throat, face, and head muscles successfully. Imagining that those small dwarves flee from each of those parts of the body, leaving the muscles completely relaxed. And when the physical body is perfectly relaxed, mental concentration becomes easy and simple. So this is a practice that you can try with, um, the, to relax yourself when you're at home or, during, or, or before your meditation. Um, some people, uh, they, they find the, the image of the, of the dwarves uh, humorous. And uh, then they laugh and this creates uh, uh, tension in the abdomen. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so sometimes we, we modify this practice to think of like uh, the tension evaporating like smoke. Well, you, whether you use the smoke or the dwarves, is, uh, is, is, it's up to you. Uh, I, either one is, um, is useful. The, the, the purpose of it is, is to focus your attention on, e on each part of your body uh, so that you're consciously relaxing each of those parts that you don't, um, and you, you go methodically through the body so that you don't uh, miss any, any source of tension. Because it's easy to carry tension around in our bodies all day and not even notice it. Um, and when he refers to, uh, to, to projects, he talked about commercial projects, um, but spiritual projects too. Um, we, we, we put project in, uh, in scare quotes when we, when we say uh, spiritual projects, right? But um, any sort of uh, spiritual uh, process that we're trying to, to, try to undergo um, should be able to, to, to utilize this, this, this mental force, the, uh, the, the harmonious combination of imagination and, and willpower um, to, to achieve results. Now, the final topic that I want to get to is um, chastity. Now, this is a Gnostic lecture, so we have to, uh, we have to begin and end talking about uh, chastity and talk about it in the middle, too. Um, uh, uh, Master M, in the Dayspring of Youth, he says, the spiritual type are most often obsessed by thoughts of sex, and those belonging to celibate religions have to control this. For the controlling of the sex nature builds up a reservoir of strength. And it is this strength that opens the door to the innermost. And so we talked about using the physical body to transform energies for the development of our consciousness. And here, Master Mori is talking about the same thing. Because the... Um, the, the, the sexual energies that the body transforms uh, become the, the essence of the, the semen, the ensa menace that, that uh, Simananda was talking about at the, uh, uh, in the quote at the beginning of the lecture. And this becomes our foundation, yesod, for all of our spiritual work. And there's, um, there's, a, there's a, a course about this topic too, called The Fuel for Spiritual Experience on our website. Um, in particular, the one about uh, uh, pranayama, which is, is, is talks about this, this in depth. Um, but really, the, this whole, the whole teaching is learning how to conserve and, and transmute and harness this energy to use it as the foundation for, um, for, for the development of our consciousness, for, for, for bridging the gap between us and God. And that's really what religion is. Religion is, is, uh, comes from the Latin religare, which means to relink. And if you relink, it means that there's, there's a gap. There's something that has been detached. And the, the, the thing that's detached is us from our inner God. So how do we bridge that gap between us and God? Through this reservoir of, of, of sexual strength that we're harnessing in our body. That's why we need the physical body. And so what, this is why it's so, uh, uh, chastity is uh, uh, viewed as so important in the spiritual work. Uh, like I was, this is the quote I was telling you before from 1 Corinthians and Paul. It says, avoid uh, uh, flea fornication. 
Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but he who fornicates sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been purchased at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, um, Jesus uh, talks about this too, and he says in, in, in two of the Gospels, um, every sin that a man commits is, uh, uh, can be forgiven, but uh, the sin against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven, neither in heaven nor on earth. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, there, there was a lot of debate in the Christian communities about this, this sin against the Holy Spirit because they, um, they have this, this, this idea that if you, you, you sin against the Holy Spirit, um, that uh, you're completely divorced from God. And they, they have the, 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 many of those traditions are based on the concept that uh, you unify yourself to God with belief. And so they say the only way to sin against the Holy Spirit is to not believe in God. But St. Paul says otherwise. St. Paul says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So he's pointing out St. Paul is taking this sin, fornication, and separating it from all other sins. Just like Jesus took sin against the Holy Spirit and separated it from all other sins. And the reason why this is, this is so, uh, so dramatic is because the very foundation of, of what religion is is based on this sexual energy, this Holy Spirit within us. And if we're, um, if we're using that energy improperly through, through, through fornication or, or, or pleasure, uh, the orgasm, then um, we're basically sabotaging everything that the spiritual work is about. We're sabotaging the, the, the purpose of religion. And that's why this, uh, this, this sin is... is um, is damned so badly in all these, uh, in, in all these scriptures. Um, also associated with this, the sin against the Holy Spirit um, is the, the types of karma that we were talking about earlier, the kamaduro and the, the kamasaya, which is related to adultery. Um, and like Jesus says, these, these karmas uh, uh, cannot be forgiven. Now, if you, you sin against the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean that, that you, you're screwed forever and ever. Um, it just means, like we were saying before, that uh, the karma has has to be paid. It can't just be it can't just be be, be wiped out or, or, or burned up with with, with cognizance. Um, it needs to be it needs to be paid with pain. But there is still there is still the door of repentance open to you. So take hope. So um, some final words on on the body. Uh, in the prologue to uh, uh, the, the book we, we have, uh, the Tibetan Exercises, or the Sacred Rites of Rejuvenation, um, Samuel says, Indubitably, we have a body of bones and flesh. Such a body possesses a marvelous eurythmy, and many powers that must be awakened are latent within the brain. Thus, it is indispensable to learn how to handle our body, to know how to take, to extract the sweetest melodies from it, it is important to make it vibrate as the symphony of the miraculous harp of the universe. It is urgent to preserve the physical body in perfect health for many years so that we can use this precious vehicle for the realization of our own inner self. Do you have any questions? Yes. Jesus did the same thing because he held, he um, he hung out hung out with with Pharisees and and sinners and and lepers. Um, we want we want to be cognizant of what are, what we're taking into um, taking into our atmosphere. Um, when Jesus was was hanging out with the uh, with the, the 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 sinners and the Pharisees, who was doing this out of um, and, and and the tax collectors, who was doing this out of out of compassion. 
and Samuel and Vior was was inviting these these black magicians and and, and evil people uh, out of uh, because he had this deep compassion, and uh, he obviously was able to handle these um, these types of the, these types of impressions in the in the astral larvae associated with this. Um, Remember, remember from, from esoteric medicine, you said that if you are vibrating in harmony with your Glorion, then, then none, of this, none of this can harm you. And so the, the way that, um, that these astral larvae affect us is by um, manipulating us through our own egos. Um, through, uh, the, for instance, um, you could, uh, some people go to a bar and they, they, they feel enticed to drink because the larvae in, in the bar um, are, are, are latching on to egos there of, of alcoholism and uh, make them want to drink. But um, I go to a bar and I don't like alcohol, right? So I feel no temptation to drink in a bar. I don't like going to bars. I don't like that atmosphere. But the larvae of, of alcoholism in that bar don't affect me. And so um, you, can, you can hang out with whatever you want wh or whoever you want, but um, be cognizant of how your own psychology, uh, the, the, and the weaknesses in your own psychology are, um, are, are, going, to, are going to affect you. And uh, don't step into situations that you don't think you can handle. I had, um, I had a, uh, a friend in college, um, this friend liked to, um, liked to smoke marijuana a lot. And she was in a lot of um, situations where they were, they were, they were uh, taking this drug. Um, and I hung out with this friend a lot in the, the, the situations where she was, uh, uh, she was smoking. And um, she, had other, uh, she, had, uh, she had two very close friends, me and, uh, me and one other person. And this, this other person hung out with her too. And as a result of hanging out with this, this, this friend, this mutual friend of ours, um, her other friend developed an addiction to the marijuana because she was always in this environment um, with the smoking and, and the, the larvae from that environment uh, latched onto her and she she. Uh, could, she developed this addiction, very sad. Um, I was in those same environments, always, always uh, around the marijuana, right? But uh, I never, uh, I always transformed those impressions. I never, I, I never took the drug. And so from this friend, I, I learned many, many, many useful things, uh, such as uh, this, this compassion for other people. Um, it, helped me, it helped me develop a lot, because uh, this person had, had, a, had a, a lot to give, and I had a lot to learn from this person. But I was selective in the things, in the aspects of, uh, of, uh, of her that I allowed to, to enter into myself, put a filter on, saying, oh, I, will, I, will, uh, I will take your empathy and compassion, but I will not take your drugs. Right. So um, treat people with compassion, but be cognizant of your weaknesses. And uh, don't, uh, don't step into situations that you know you can't handle. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.